Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames have played three games and they're undefeated. I don't think either of us or anyone out in the Sea of Red expected the Flames to start so strong. I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, um, you thought they were going to go 0 and 3. It was week, a verbal typo. You know, you, I said 0 and 3. I said, meant to say 3 and 0. Yes. There's a 3 and there's a 0. You <laughs> yes. just didn't put them in the right order. Exactly. It was just a mistake. Verbal it's like that typo. game mastermind, right yeah. color, wrong position. Um, it, I mean, before we jump into the games, this is crazy. Like, you know, the, the flames usually don't get things going until like Christmas time and they're already three and oh, well, like last year, the, their record at the end of October was literally two, seven and one. So three games in, we've already beat last year's mark for that. It, you know, like they could literally lose every game for the rest of the month. We'll still have a better October than last year. And that's crazy. It is, you know, and, and well, let's jump into the games, then we can talk more about it. So the Flames opened their season uh, against the Vancouver Canucks in Vancouver, and this was a high-scoring game, but the Flames ended up winning in OT, 6-5 over Vancouver. That was one of those games we said in the preseason we weren't going to see in those six-goal games for the Flames. Dan Vlar started in net for the Flames and played the whole game there. Um, quite a, a passionate game, I'd say, in this one. Yeah, well... Uh- the Flames really got off their game in the first period after JT Miller hit Rooney into the boards and Rooney slammed his head against the boards. The Flames just seemed like they were chasing the Canucks around wanting to fight. Yeah, which makes sense, especially, you know, like, it, you know, you see Rooney down on the ice and you have the fans chanting the name of the guy that hit him, you know, like that's bound to piss anybody off period like you know and you know it kind of gets it's no longer a hockey game at that point it's like we're kind of out for blood at this point and the flames you know got into a bunch of trouble with that and uh in terms of penalties against and uh vancouver poured four goals in in the first period and you know, it wasn't until the end of the period with Anthony Mantha actually being able to fight JT Miller uh, that kind of like, okay, that's done, justice served, let's carry on with the game after that. After that first period, I was worried. Like, I just, the Flames looked like they'd come apart because the Rooney thing, and they were down 4-1, to one, and I don't know about you, but going on the second, I said this one's already over. I had the opposite feeling. I'm like, you know because everything basically that could have went wrong in that period did it's like i'm not sure if the flames might settle their game down and get going and you know slowly turn the game around and you saw that in the second period where you know like it wasn't an immediate turnaround like they scored in the first five minutes but you know like they started getting shift after shift in vancouver's zone and getting good zone pressure and uh, the hard working uh, play that we've seen during the preseason, and you started to see the ice start to tilt in Calgary's direction, and then you know they had to work hard, yeah. and they did. They worked hard and they chipped away at that score, and uh, yeah, they they did it. And I had a feeling when it went to overtime, I thought you know what, Calgary looks like they got the momentum right now. Yeah, and then that play by Pospisil in overtime. With that uh, crashing the net, but stopping right on Silov's doorstep, uh, you know, as a goalie, you see this like six foot five wall of you know person coming hard right at you. It's hard not to get distracted by that. So, yeah, it, and then Zari with an absolutely fantastic play to deke out uh, Ronick and um, Silov, and you know, Flames earn two points. There's not a flame in this game that I can look at and say they didn't contribute positively. No, everybody, you know, especially after the first period, got on the same page and everybody was pulling in the same direction. And it, it like, especially like when it hit 4 2 and then 4 3, like it felt inevitable that the flames were going to take the lead. And sure enough, like only a few minutes later, they did and, you know, managed to get it to overtime and collect the win. An interesting note here, Sam Honzig, obviously in the starting lineup for this one, he's uh, not even 20 yet. And going back the past 25 years, he's only the sixth teenager to earn his spot in the Flames lineup. 
The others, Rico Fata in 99, Oleg Saprik in also in 99, Sean Monahan in 2013, Sam Bennett in 2015, and Matthew Kachuk in 2016. So, um, uh, Also, uh, Yusuf Valimaki did too. When he was less than 20? Yep. Okay. They said it on Hat- the broadcast uh, for the Oilers game tonight, so... Half those guys you want to be in a club with, half the guys you don't want to be in a club with. Well, with Hanzik's play, uh, he definitely looks on the better half of that scorecard than the not so good half. He's not on the Rico Fata side. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, I mean, great way to start the season for the Flames. I think you know, Flames fans had a lot of fun with that one. I really said, and I was saying this online. I was saying this to people in my everyday life. That game is going to get the Flames fired up, and I just had this feeling that. After that game and showing they come back and showing if they do it right, they could do it. That the Flames were going to have a good week, and they did. We saw the home opener, uh, Calgary Flames and Philadelphia Flyers, kind of a weird pairing, but that's who we had for the home opener. Um, and that was on Saturday night. The Calgary Flames get a big six-three win over the Philadelphia Flyers, and boy, did that one feel good. Yeah, uh, the. F- First two periods for the Flames, I felt, was actually quite sloppy by the team. Um, You know, like, I was at the game, and the person I was with, like, I was saying to them that, you know, like, and pointing out, like, the lack of situational awareness of, like, where players are in relation to each other, like, how to make passes and such. Like, everything just seemed a little disjointed, especially in the second period. Uh, but in, once the third period started, it was a different team entirely. I can understand the first period feeling that way. These guys had a lot of time between their warm-ups and then with the Johnny ceremony and all the opening ceremonies. You often see that kind of when you have those long ceremony days. Yeah, it it just it was a little concerning, especially as the second period got on. And you saw like the two goals by the Flyers where like the Flames' lack of situational awareness uh caused odd man rushes with guys being wide open for tap ins, which that doesn't normally happen if you're, you know, being cohesive defensively. Yeah, and I thought, you know, on that too, I thought the wolf at the beginning didn't look great, but it looked like he by the second sort of found him found his uh I guess his NHL form. Frankly, uh, in the first period I thought he was the only reason the Flames were actually ahead. Um, I thought he was very strong in his net and was showing a lot of flashes of being a star caliber goaltender and, you know, stuck with it in the second period, despite the two goals that uh, like no goalie was stopping either of those. Um, Speaking of guys who look like stars, Matt, here's something I never thought I would say. Jonathan Huberto got four points in this game. I know. First time as a flame. It's like Johnny channeled other Johnny to actually, you know, get some points. Yep. Um, yeah, Huberto in this game gets two goals and two assists for four points. He had one point the night before against Vancouver. That's five points in the first two games. So I did a little bit of math. If he continues to produce at a 2.5 point per game pace, he would reach 53 points, which is one point more than he got last year in 21 games. And if he were to continue that all season, he'd beat over 200 points. So maybe we'll get our money's worth on this guy. Well, this is the Huberto that I've seen, you know, watching Panthers games off and on for like the last decade. Um, you know, so like this was the player I was expecting that we'd be getting when we traded for him. And then, you know, like he was not there uh, for the first two seasons as a flame. And, you know, if he plays like this, like this is 90 plus point Huberto, not 50 point Huberto. And, you know, like, he was very impactful in every game, including the Oilers game, and, you know, finding good passes, and he's got line mates that are working well with him. Mantha and Pospisil are creating havoc because of their size and their um, determination to drive to the net. And even if you, you know, if you listen to it, um, when he was talking to the media after the game, the Philadelphia game, and talking about, you know, driving that one goal in with his shoulder, and he was having fun, he was joking, I think he even said that's kind of what he meant to do, like, you know, you can just tell that he's feeling good about where he's at, and I think hockey is so much a mental game, if you're not feeling good, if you're not feeling confident, you're not going to do well, so even just seeing him joking around like that, I thought 
yes, this is the Jonathan Huberto that we need. Yeah, and you you've seen like over the last two years, like him hanging his head on the bench, you know, the kind of like a sullen attitude um, when being interviewed uh, because things aren't quite clicking for him. And, like, he's been all smiles since the start of the season and, you know, feeling good about himself and his game, which is translating directly into the results on the ice. It's nice to see, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Not the guy I was expecting to have five points after the first two games. Well, he had more goals than Edmonton did, and he's now tied with them after the next game. Uh, So, yeah. Well, let's talk about that one. So the Calgary Flames play a back-to-back. Quick trip up to Edmonton, and as we record this on uh, Thanksgiving Sunday, the game is concluded. 4-1 win for the Calgary Flames over the Edmonton Oilers. The Oilers starting 0-3 now on the season. Kind of the opposite of what everyone expected, I think, for the two Alberta teams. Uh, Big win for Calgary here. Anderson had a goal and two assists in this one, and Mantha, Zari, Kirkland get a goal. That's Kirkland's first NHL goal. Always awesome to see. What an what a fun game to watch! Yeah, and you know, like uh, I'm sure a lot of Oiler fans are going to be really frustrated with the two goals called back, uh, as we heard from the announcers during the game constantly about you know all of that and like oh it should be three nothing right now. Um, no, the two goals were called back because you know you can't interfere with the goalie and you are offside. What? There's rules? I know. They actually apply to all 32 teams, not just, That's right. you know, 31. Um, <laughs> interesting notes here. Dan Vladar in net as well. Barry and Coronado drew in both for the first time this season, and Klapka and Bean drew out of the lineup. Yeah, and, and I, I felt that Bean kind of struggled in the Flyers game, so I wasn't surprised to see him get a night off. And Klapka, I'm a little surprised because I thought he was quite effective in the Flyers game, but... I'm wondering if he might have been banged up or something. Possibly. I think you also, and we'll talk a little about this later, I think you need to find a way to get Coronado in. True. Um, and, and I think if you're going to take a guy out at this point, Klapka's had a hard two games, maybe even say, hey, if you're not banged up, you probably will be. Let's rest you before we get there. Well, and you also don't want necessarily penalties to be taken. And uh, with Klapka's game, that's very much more likely than with Coronado's game. And... In a run-gun battle, you'd prefer Coronado's skill set uh, over the crash and bang uh, that Klapka brings. You're totally right. So with that, Matt, the Flames now have played three games. They have won three, lost zero, no overtime losses for six total points. That puts them at the top of the Pacific Division, not what we thought we'd be saying this season. Well, we're uh, actually the- tied with uh, Dallas, Winnipeg, and of all teams, Utah, Uh with a three and zero start, so we're number one. Yes. <laughs> um, so enjoy it, and you know, you and I talked about this in the preseason. Like we said, we're don't get used to these weeks of six goals a night. Like this is not going to happen. And here we are, three nights in, and the Flames have sixteen goals on the board. Can't complain at all. <laughs> you know, like that's yeah, sure, fine, take it. <laughs> The crazy thing about all this, too, I mean, when I reflect on the week, I don't think you mentioned, you know, the Philadelphia game. I think in all three games, the Flames had a a tough time getting started. I don't think they played great first periods in any of these. And they're also doing it without their lead scorer last year. Igor Sharon Govich is still out. So I think that says something, too. Like, this is a team that's missing their top scorer. Their nobody scorer in Huberto is stepping up. Like, when Sharon Govich comes back, it can only get more interesting. Yeah, and you're seeing the positive effect of guys like Pospisil, like Mantha, like Lomberg, like Klapka in the lineup where their relentless uh, puck pursuit is causing havoc for the other teams because like, even if they're not uh, generating offensive scoring chances, like they're making the other team have to work. And as the game goes on, it wears those teams down and... The Flames, more skill guys, are able to, you know, get openings and get scoring chances and goals that we've seen. And I have to imagine part of the reason they can play that way is because they come into the season with no expectations. Like, I think when you come in with these expectations of playoffs or, you know, finals or whatever, there's a lot of pressure on these guys. I think maybe coming in saying, we're not expected to do anything. 
let's prove people wrong. And you know what? If we don't, hey, what have we got to lose, right? But I have to imagine that there's some almost some mental freedom there for this team to just come in and play their way and not be too worried. Yeah, and then, you know, you kind of have to be uh, too stupid to figure out that you're supposed to be bad. <laughs> you know, like, you're just go out and, you know, create havoc. And what's the worst that can happen? Oh, what everybody expects? Yeah, or you can surprise people. That's kind of what I mean. Like, you know, you go out and you do it and you don't get the result you want. Well, what's the worst that happens is we're right back where everybody expects us to be. Yeah. So, you know, and if you can be make it life hell for the other team knowing that they're gonna have to give it their all every night even if you do come out on the losing side of things you know you make the other team earn those two points and not want to have to play calgary and you know like when you have uh, you know like six guys that are over six four you know it's hard to you know especially when all of those guys play a physical brand of hockey you're gonna be feeling it after the game because you're gonna have to keep your head up at all times and it's not gonna be fun yeah, and, and that's why like i said i wouldn't be surprised if klapka got rotated out like you said maybe for penalties or maybe just to keep him fresh mm -hmm. um but speaking of that like okay this is one thing that i've been thinking about is coronado's played one of the three games so far and that was the Edmonton game and he's playing on the fourth line which is not where i think you want this guy when they had him on the team on opening day, I kind of expected they were going to find a spot from the top nine. I wasn't sure where, but I thought you've got to have this guy in the top nine. I even thought maybe, you know, Hansi would play a game or two and not stick around. I don't think you can keep Coronado here playing one in every three games. I don't think you can keep him here as an everyday fourth liner. Like, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think if they can't by the end of next week find this guy a regular top nine slot, he's got to go back to the Wranglers just so he can get more games played. I agree. And... You know, I don't think that the Flames expected Hansik to be as much of a standout as he actually has been in the three games. Uh, like, each of the games, he has been robbed of goals, and he has generated multiple scoring chances and come close a number of times in each game. And, you know, if he was kind of on the invisible side, I think you would have seen Coronado swapped in for Hansik, but... You know, if he's running with it, you kind of just... Yeah, I think, I think they brought those two guys up saying you're battling for one spot. Yeah, and, you know, if Honzik wasn't playing as good, you, but he is, so take the ball and run with it. And, and again, it doesn't mean Honzik has to be here all year. Like, no. maybe Honzik's good for the first 10, and you send Coronado down and get him some reps with Peltier or whatever on the farm, and then if Honzik cools down, you swap him. Yeah. You know, that's the nice thing about having... Both guys that are not waiver uh, eligible, but like to me, you can't you can't play corn auto one every three. No, and if it wasn't for the Rooney situation, I think that uh, you might have seen Coronado sent down already. But um, you know, it just it, it's tough because uh, like with the rest of the line and it's looking actually really good, it's hard to pencil in anybody anywhere else at the moment well, let's talk a little about the Rooney situation so um Rooney gets hurt in the first game of the season he is the fourth line center for the flames they were short of forward the whole time needed to call up a center after that I bet they probably wish we could call up Cole Schwint but lost him earlier in the week to waivers to Vegas did not lose Peltier which we thought they might have last year so you go crap Who's our number two? 28-year-old Justin Kirkland gets the call. This is his second tour of duty with the Flames organization. First tour of duty with the Flames. He was in Stockton before. He's come up, and I think he's I think he's actually looking more impactful than what we saw from Rooney even during the preseason as a fourth-line center. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where sometimes guys figure it out later in their career. Like uh, Derek Grant, for example came to us from Buffalo being that kind of in-between guy, stayed an in-between guy, but then has found a regular spot with the Anaheim Ducks for the last, like, five or six years. Um, and, like, he was 27, 28 when he got here. And, you know, things like that do happen. And, you know, I, I know some fans were expecting Sam Morton to get the call instead of Kirkland, but uh, the coaching staff had assigned Morton a bunch of things that he needed to work on, and the Wranglers camp hadn't really started yet, so 
you wouldn't have had anything different from what he already was at that point. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know why you would think Morton. Like, at this point, Morton is, he's barely played professional hockey. I don't know. I think he got, what, like, maybe 10, I could look it up, 10 pro games last year in the AHL. Like, that's not the guy you're bringing up yet to play on your NHL roster. That's a guy you need some seasoning for. Um, I agree. You know, and I think Cole Schwint was the next guy up. Like, being the last cut, that's generally the first guy up. So, Matt, one of our predictions already wrong. Neither of us thought Justin Kirkland gets the call, but um, we're doing poorly as always with those. Yeah, but I could totally mild see Kirk there. <laughs> no, no, I'm not either. But, you know, I could see, like, when I look at this roster, I think if you're going to carry an extra forward, you need to carry an extra centerman if you're only going to carry one. Right now, the Flames have eight D, so they can only carry 13 forwards. I could see Kirkland sticking with the team as the – he's not going to get any better in the American League. Um, I think you could see Kirkland stick with the Flames as the number 13 once either Coronado or Hunzig is sent down and uh, and then have you know him and Rooney as your as your centers. Yeah, I think they will send uh, Kirkland down only just because the Wranglers need centers too and – because they weren't really anticipating Schwint going away, and the, the Wranglers weren't really very well stocked with centers in the first place. So, uh, you know, it, I, I think that, like, outside of, like, acquiring a AHL veteran via trade um, for the standard future considerations, um, like, outside of that, I think Kirkland has to go down only for that reason. But I, I feel that... He has definitely earned like another shot at any point later on. I'm looking at the list of centermen for the Wranglers. You've got Nikolaev. He's not ready really for the call yet. Clark Bishop. He's not coming up. Uh, Alex Galanta. I don't think is on an NHL contract. Um, and Jaden Lipinski. You're not bringing up Sam Morton. I wouldn't bring up. Those are your centermen. So, yeah, you definitely need one down there. The only other guy I could see them maybe trying would be Dryden Hunt because the coach seems to like him and see if you get him to be a centerman. Yeah. Well, and he had, did play briefly as the fourth-line center last year. He so. did, yeah. But, I, I, yeah, so I think you can maybe get him as, like, your wing center if you want another veteran guy. Yep. But uh, you're right. I think of all those guys, like, Kirkland makes the most sense to come up and down. You're probably not losing Kirkland at all. No. He's 28. Um, I guess the question is, like, the, we always talk about goal songs. If uh, if Kirkland scores at home, do you then they put the Costco logo, Kirkland signature up there, if he has some sort of special move he does? Well, um, that uh, goal that he scored certainly wasn't a generic brand goal. There you go. No no-name here. Yeah. <laughs> the man's got a Costco membership. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's nice to talk about, you know, uh, let's be honest, a tweener guy like Kirkland coming in and not just scoring, but I think even in the Edmonton game, he looked like he belonged. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, it's always nice to see guys who have put in the hard work throughout the years uh, getting their chance in the NHL. And, you know, just like with guys like Hansik and uh coronado you know if he pushes his way into the team you know things can be d done to maneuver around that and you know he was full marks in that contest i would say in the edmonton contest too yeah um both edmonton both philly he yes. looks good um how long do you give coronado here like when when do you send him back down i'd probably give uh two more games to see the if the uh Hanzik uh, slows down at all. Um, and if so, then, you know, put Coronado in his spot. But um, beyond that, I, I just kind of, you know, well, the nice I thing is him sending down. down doesn't really mean like going away. It means going the next room over. Yes, exactly. It's not like he's going to be in Stockton and it takes a while to get him back. Exactly. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, we got Chicago next. I would probably find a way to put, um, to put Coronado in the lineup. I think Coronado over Klapka makes sense for Chicago, but yeah. not if he's on the fourth line. Yeah, and then Seattle on the weekend. And then Seattle. And you might want a little bit of more physicality there. But, yeah, I think you, you go the rest of the week, and then you send Coronado down if you need to. Talking about guys that were sent down, surprise, Peltier is still a flame? Uh, not really. 
Surprised that 31 other teams didn't take a shot at him? Not really. Uh, he. I think, I think it says some the player though. Like you know, you're you, nobody wants you for free. You got some stuff to work on. Yeah, like it's one thing. Like it really sucks to get cut, but then when you're like anybody can just take you, and they're like, yeah, we're good. That's. We'd rather have Cole Schwint over you. Yes, like that's not. You know, like if any but anything is going to kick you in the butt to get your gear going so that way you can get back to the nhl like that's a big 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 wake-up call and for sure you know and peltier has a lot of work to do and he needs frankly he needs to look at guys like ryan lomberg like uh adam klapka and that to see how they play as like energy players on a team and you know, like he needs to figure out that aspect of his game if he wants to be an NHL player and take that next step. Because you know, just being good, aware defensively, you know, that like that's not enough. Like you need to I do that and like create havoc or be able to chip in some offense here and there. And if you're only doing one thing like unless you're Connor mcdavid doing that one thing that's never good enough yeah and i mean don't get me wrong when i'm joking about you know cole schwint being taken i think cole schwint was ready to be an angel centerman i'm not surprised that somebody took a chance on him because i think he's ready for the big leagues i don't think peltier is and you're talking about some of the guys you think peltier should take notes from i think you should take notes from coronado like look at coronado and how bad he looked at the beginning of last year when the flames had him on the roster they send him down He worked his butt off, it seemed like, in the Wranglers. He looked really good there. And when they called him up again after the deadline, it looked like a very different player. Yeah, exactly. And just because you're down there for now doesn't mean that you're down there permanently. Like, if you earn your way back, the Flames will call you up. Well, that's it. And use that. Don't sit around being butthurt that you got sent down. Like, you know, go down there, work hard, understand what they want you to work on, and do those things. Yeah, like you just have to point at uh, Connor Zari, Martin Pospisil, and Sam Honzik as, hey, you play well, you're going to get prime time minutes with prime time players. And, yeah, you know, it's up to you to actually earn it. So, you know, go to it. Yeah. And, and you know, I think, I mean, Peltier is still still around. He's on a, He's on a one year deal. So, you know, it's not like he's necessarily here forever if this doesn't work out. But I think right now it's his, the ball's in his court, right? He's with the Flames organization. They're happy to stub him around, I think. He's going to get minutes. I mean, we saw it even this weekend. He got lots of minutes with the Wranglers. He's on, he's going to be one of their top forwards there if he's playing well. Use that time to develop. Exactly. And I think we need to. I think fans, I think we've done it, and I think other people have done it. We've overvalued him because of where he's picked. Yeah, you know, well, and, and I think we, well, and frankly, I think we need to take that out of the discussion. He was showing a lot more before his injuries. And, he was. You know, like he looked more or less like the next, like Andrew Mangiapane type of guy who could be a reliable, you know, secondary score energy guy kind of thing. And then, like, last year was an absolute disaster for him. Uh, with the injuries and like he needs to find refine that spark again um, that he had because like he was a very tenacious player before the injuries and like if he can do that and like recapture his potential like it's still there it's just he needs to get back on the but horse. I think that a lot of times first round picks get more leeway or more leash than they should and I think we need to take that out of the equation Oh, for sure. Like, the way I look at it is, basically, if you're getting an NHL player out of anybody taken after pick 20, like, that's kind of a bonus, not an expected thing. And, you know, if they actually become, say, like, Connor Zari, for example, like, that's a home run of a pick instead of an expected, like, oh, this guy was a first rounder, he should be a top player. Um, especially at that part of the draft. And uh, Pelty, I do believe, was drafted 26th overall, which, uh, you know, like that's, you, you know, if he turns out great, but, you know, 
it's also yeah, like it's in 50 50 zone. 24th overall, and in Peltier, you're right, I think 26th. It's kind of a 50 50 if that guy's going to make the NHL at that rate. And, you know, this is where we need to look at a whole draft class. Like, I mean, Martin Pospisil, we, I think we can all say right now, is a NHL player, and he was drafted in the fourth round. So, if, you know, if you have a first rounder who doesn't turn out and a fourth rounder who does, I mean, I'm not saying they're from the same draft, but, you know, you've got to look up and down the draft. I mean, you know, our goaltender, seventh round pick, right? Th- third last pick in the draft for Wolf. Like, you've got to look at the draft as a whole and not just put as much emphasis as a lot of people do on pick one or pick two. No, and, like, that's why, like, especially with the Flames' track record over the last decade of being able to find those late-round gems that, um, you know, like, they are needing guys to cover uh, for the occasional miss pick, um, whether it's a first-rounder or a second-rounder or whatever, you know, um, and thankfully the Flames have been able to get those guys like Pospisil uh, later in the draft to balance out things overall. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's just more, more ammo when you can, you know, you got guys like Possible. I mean, you know, I I'll constantly remind people, Johnny Hockey, one of the best ever lace him up here, fourth rounder. Like, well, you Theo know, you, Fleury gotta, was like a ninth round pick. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, you've got to look up and down, up and down that draft and scour it and give everybody equal opportunity. Yep. How would you say it's always easy to draft Connor McDavid first overall? It's harder to find, you know, players at 20, 30, 50, 70, 120, 200 and some. Next topic I want to move on to you is the division of labor for the goalies so far. We're three games in. We've seen Dan Vladar start two, and we saw um, Dustin Wolf start one, which was the Edmonton game. Are you surprised that Wolf has been looked at as sort of the backup so far? Um, were you expecting it to go the other way? Wolf 2, Vladar 1. What has been your thoughts on the division of goalie? Um, I, I was frankly expecting Vladar to get the uh, two of the first three uh, with uh, Wolf getting the home opener. And um, uh, like I expect them kind of tra- to trade off. Uh, you know, like I'm expecting uh, Wolf to get the Chicago game and Vladar the Seattle game. It's almost Uh, like we have a home goalie and a road goalie at that point. More or less. And, you know, uh, I think that for at least the first month or so of the season, you kind of just have each guy alternate. And that way, neither guy is getting overworked. And, you know, Vladar needs to get reps just to get back into it after his hip injury. Wolf needs to get more experience at the NHL and then after like a month or two figure out who's the better guy and give that guy slightly more of the starts than you know work it yeah, out Yeah and we way. have to remember Dan, Dan Vladar is probably coming in as the veteran here I mean he's the guy that's been around the NHL longer he has more NHL work I'm not surprised he's got the first two I think he's probably coming in sort of with that he was the heir apparent to Markstrom Markstrom's gone and I think you know it's probably his starter job to lose in a way to the young kid. Um, I think you're right. I mean, we talked about our predictions last week. I think Vladar will probably get slightly more starts throughout the season, but I think you're going to see an equal workload here. This isn't going to be a 50 game, you know, Wolf campaign. And especially if the team can win with both goalies, you don't want to, you don't want to tire each one out. You don't want to overwork them. Um, I, I think, you know, doing every other, or even doing, let's call it a three to one, you know, Vladar, you know, as a starter, I think would be fine too. Well, and the thing is, is that like, they're both learning how to do a different job, but they're both learning in the same way. Like Vladar has learned how to be an NHL goaltender and now is learning how to be an NHL starter. And Wolf is learning how to be an NHL goaltender. Um, so, you know, they're both being able to push each other in the learning experience. And I think Wolf is also learning, and, and it does take learning on both sides, but Wolf is also learning how to stay ready without playing every night. Mm-hmm. S- you know, starting goaltenders are very used to being ready and being ready to play every night. Backups, there's a lot more around mental and physical endurance there. If you got to come in cold at a moment's notice and be ready to go, 
and how do you stay fresh? And when you got, you know, often we see it with backups who become a starter is learning that. And there's some guys that can't. They're a really good backup because they're good sparingly, but they can't do, you know, two nights in a row or two nights in four, you know, four days or something like that. So I think you're seeing Ken Dan Vladar do the every week or every night, you know, three, two times a week, three times a week, whatever. And can Dustin Wolf learn how to sit on the bench and not play? Because if you look at how much play time he got with the Wranglers, if you look at how much time play time he got in the dub, this is a guy who's used to being the, you know, 80% goaltender. Yeah. And well, and in each of those years, he was basically the league's best goaltender in, you know, when he was the starter in Everett all the way through with the Wranglers. And, you know, it, it's a different mindset, but he also has to adapt to the faster shots from players, the more hectic action that you see in NHL games, and, you know, taking those next steps. And young goalies usually, in their first full season, tend to struggle a little bit, especially when they get too much ice time. Uh, just because, like, the, it's a lot. And with uh, Wolf's more athletic style, like, it, it's hard to keep that um, 100% on point every game um, without, you know, fatigue coming in and, like, all of those kind of secondary factors that aren't as obvious. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, we've seen guys who play in an athletic style like Wolf have a couple good years and then not be able to do it physically. And I think one of the benefits, too, to slowing Wolf down a little bit is you're going to get more out of that player. Yeah. And, you know, like sometimes they do actually hit and stick, uh, like uh, Jonathan Quick being a prime example of that, where uh, up until like his last year or so of uh being a king uh he was pretty much a top tier goaltender uh you know sometimes that happens other times the guy flames out right away too um but yeah and and i've just I, i'm thinking in my head of a number of goalies who played that who just you know as they get older they're more injury prone they're you know they're not looking the same they got changed their game like we I think the more you can not throw Wolf in and need that kind of number from him, the more you're going to be able to prolong that player. Yeah, and especially in a season like this where, like, despite our good start, you know, like, frankly, this season itself doesn't really matter in the scheme of things. Like, if they make the playoffs, great. That's a unexpected, wonderful bonus. But, you know, like, everybody's... You're sitting here thinking, three down, 79 wins to go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Run that table. <laughs> That's right. First team ever to do it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you, you know, we got to be honest. I mean, it, you know, it's three games. It's looking good. But, yeah, I mean, even the goalies, if they can win with Vladar and Net, you got to keep running, you know, like you said, may, probably every other makes the most sense or, you know, t two to one or something like yeah, that. But like, especially you gotta, on you got to keep rotating. Yeah, like on busier weeks where, like, the Flames are playing three or four games, Probably you see uh, Vladar play a little bit more than Wolf in that situation. But, you know, um, yeah, it, it's good to keep both guys fresh, though. I agree. And we have to remember, too, Vladar is actually in a contract year this year. So, you know, he's going to be looking for a new deal. And he's going to want to be showing that he can make more than $2 million a year. So, you know, I think both these guys have something that they're working towards this year. Exactly. And... You know, whether Ladar stays as a flame or not, like it, it's important for him to show that, like, either, hey, I am an NHL starter or I am just a high quality backup, which, you know, um, price tag of contract will be, you know, commiserate with that. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out. And being out. that he is in his last year, I mean, he's not a guy many people have talked about, but depending on where the team's out of the deadline, I could totally see Dan Vladar getting moved at the deadline to a contender and Devin Cooley being brought up. That's also a potential situation. You know, so Vladar might be trying to audition himself there. True. I thought for a while Boston might be a good place for him to land again, but uh, they got their guy now. Yeah. I I was honestly surprised. I thought with Boston Payne Swayman, what they did, they were going to come knocking on the flames door trying to dump a salary quickly. 
I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to anyway, and just like I, as soon as I saw Swayman was signed, I'm like, yeah, okay, the Flames are bringing another piece. Who are they going to bring in? Because I thought Boston's going to need a quick salary dump. Yeah, and um, I'm very glad that the Flames do have that ability. Uh, Twenty million dollars. Yes, to just you know two Huberdos. That's how we're going to start measuring salary cap yes, space. Exactly. Um, I'm. I don't know how much Boston's got. Let me see. Probably two, talking about it. Probably hundred and hundred and fifty thousand. I was gonna say uh, probably around two hundred thousand, but it was even less than that. That's bad. Yeah, and, that, and I don't know if they've got any. Uh, they got two buyouts and no buried contracts. So yeah, I mean they could easily get into salary trouble with one hundred fifty thousand left that they're gonna need to come knocking. Oh. So well, that'll be for another show down the road. Um, quickly wanted to go through who the top point getters for the Flames are. Before you start looking ahead. Surprising, Jonathan Huberto. Again, top of that list. Something I never thought I'd see in, in my time as a Flames fan. Uh, he has three, goal, three goals, two assists for five points. Rasmus Anderson also has five points, two goals, three assists. And Marty Pospisil, one goal and four assists for five total points. So um, those are our top point getters. The top goal getter, obviously, Huberto. Kadri has two and Uyghur has two. Mantha has two, and Anderson two, and Zari two. I'm glad to see um, Anthony Mantha right up there. Like He's looked great in his first couple games. He's competing, and to see him up there near the top of the goal getters is awesome. Well, and you have to figure that with Mantha, um, he's realizing that like it's not very hard for him to fall out of the NHL. And, like, you know, he got healthy scratched when he was with Vegas in the playoffs, and, you know, like, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, like, if you're not good enough, you're not going to stay. And, you know, because, like, eventually the calls stop coming. And when you accept a one-year deal at $3 million as kind of a show-me contract, you know, seeing him with a fire lit under his rear end, is you know also being I mean, even that first play. Vancouver game, he was right in there. He was scrappy. He was you know like he, he sometimes it takes a guy a, a little bit of time to sort of acclimate to you know being part of a new team, and he seems like he's already all bought in. Yep, and you know like if this is the player that he plays for most of the eighty-two games this year, I'm more than We're happy having him, him back. Gone. Yeah, I'm more more than happy to have him back. Yeah, and he, I mean, and if he doesn't want to come back, which I understand if he doesn't, hey, it'll, you know, it sucks to see him go. Yep. Top assist getters right now, Marty Postel has four, Andre Kuzmenko has four, Rasmus Anderson has three. Again, a guy who it's going to suck when he leaves. And I think, you know, I actually wouldn't be surprised if Kuzmenko signed here, but I don't think he's going to. I think that's another guy that's going to suck when he's gone. Yeah, it, we'll see how the season turns out. Like, if I think if the Flames are pushing to be a playoff team this year which could happen um like we saw this in 14 15 where you know a bunch of nobodies kind of you know elevated the whole team to the playoffs um it, it's one of those where like in that kind of a situation i, I would assume that like most of the guys would want to actually stay and come back so at that rate and you know um and frankly, you know, I know that like some people are concerned about our draft pick situation with the Montreal trade, but you know, if the Flames make the playoffs, I don't think anybody's going to care too much if we lose like the twentieth overall pick. Um, in that. No, and and I mean the Flames, even if they keep playing like this and they're not bad enough to be in the top ten, whether you're getting sixteen or twenty two this year, I don't think there's a lot of difference. No. I mean, I, I haven't extensively scouted this draft, but just from what I can see, yeah, it, I think it that, seems that, that like middle the, pack is going to be all about the same. Yeah, like uh, there's about five guys that are pretty good, and then about another eight or so that are it, a tier below, and then it gets into the you know usual tier of you know ifs and maybes. <laughs> Well, I think that's uh, about it for this week. I mean, three games. Seems like we'd have lots to talk about, but it's just go Flames and, you know, keep going. Is there anything else from this week you want to dive into? Well, um, I, the only thing that I has been a little bit concerning is just the, the overall defensive awareness of the team. 
especially in the first bit of each of the games, and I think they need to tighten that up. Um, especially, I think the defense in a lot of ways though is going to be the the Achilles heel this year. Oh, for sure. Um, but you know, it's nice to see younger guys that are trying to learn, like Ball, uh, like Bean, Pahal. Um, that are trying to establish themselves. And even Miramanov has actually played fairly decently, even though he's not used to top-pairing minutes. So we'll see. It's just a thing to keep an eye on as we're moving forward. Yeah, something to watch this week as we see what happens and what the Flames end up doing and how they move forward. But before we talk about that, um, let's remind our, our fans. I mean, tonight's Battle of Alberta night. It seems like a great way to remind people. Flames are up one nothing in the Battle of Alberta this year. Um, and next time there's a Battle of Alberta, we're going to be live at Bow River Brewing's Tap House with our friends there. We're going to be doing a Battle of Alberta trivia during the next Battle of Alberta game on November 3rd. That's a Sunday night, so come on out. We'd love to have you there. Come play by yourself. Grab your line mates and come play together. We're going to have two games during that night, one during the first intermission, one during the second intermission, so there's two chances to win. And then the winners from both periods are going to go head-to-head in the third for ultimate winner of the night. Matt, we did this uh, last year. It was so much fun. I really enjoyed that, and I'm hoping everybody will come out. It's going to be Battle of Alberta trivia. Maybe when we get some Edmonton fans out and we can see if we can make sure that they lose. But... uh, (laughs) It's, you know, if, if you're an Edmonton fan coming out to play Battle of Alberta Trivia in Calgary, you probably deserve to lose, but let's hope we get at least one of them. It's going to be a lot of fun. Everybody mark your calendars November 3rd. Um, I think the game starts at 6 p.m. that night. If you want more details, you can go to firesidechat.ca and you'll see Battle of Alberta Trivia in the navigation. Check our Facebook page or we'll be putting it out through uh, our other social media as well over the coming weeks. It was a lot of fun last time. and Definitely looking forward to the next one. So brush up on your Battle of Alberta trivia. I mean, there's a lot of stats during the game tonight. Start making notes because you're going to need them for the next game. And uh, what goes better with hockey than beer and pizza? They're doing the same specials for us that we've had the last couple of times. $6 beer all night, any beer on their menu, and $13 pizzas. And I think you and I are both big fans of their pizzas. Yes. So come on out, have some fun, have some beer, have some pizza. Let's watch the game together. We'll be sitting watching the game with fans during the game. So you can chat with Matt, chat with me, come hang out. And then during the intermissions, we'll be uh, we'll be playing for some awesome prizes. So check that out. But Matt, um, that's a few weeks in, in the future. We should talk about the next week and make our predictions. We talked about both being wrong last week, thankfully. I thought we'd beat Philadelphia and lose the other two. You thought we'd lose all three. Verbal typos. Um, Okay, so whatever you tell me this week, I'm going to switch it around when I jot these down. (laughs) All right, the Flames have two games this week. They play uh, Tuesday night in the Saddle Dome against the Chicago Blackhawks, and then they have three days off and Saturday in Seattle against the Seattle Kraken. So what's your non-typo prediction this week? One and one. That way it's front and back. So All right, who do they beat? Uh, I feel that uh, they'll beat uh, Chicago and lose to Seattle. I think that's a very reasonable expectation. Um, I'm going to be the homer here. I'm going to say that they extend the win streak to five. Cool. I don't think they will. Like, this has got to end sometime. And I don't think you're getting your seven, eight, nine game win streak to start the season with this group. But these are two very beatable teams. Yeah. You better beat Chicago. Though we've had a hell of a time with them the last couple seasons. Yeah, for whatever reason, uh, Chicago and Columbus, just the bad teams in general, we tend to find a way to lose. And uh, Seattle, I don't know, after three days rest, again, I don't know what Seattle's schedule looks like, but I feel like the the Flames should, after three days rest, be able to go in there and, and play a pretty competitive game against the Kraken. Yeah. It's an, it's an easy trip. It's an 8 p.m. game. Um, I see no reason the Flames shouldn't be able to go out there and, and do their thing. Who do you put in net for each of those games? Wolf and Vladar. Yeah, I would go the same. I think I'd give Wolf the Chicago game at home. Yeah, because I, I kind of like this idea of like Wolf plays at home, Vladar plays on the road. Yeah, because the way I look at it is that, you know, like if you're uh, swapping it around, like uh, Vladar will only have like one day rest. And like Wolf would be on like a full week's rest, and like that just doesn't seem 
quite right. No, it doesn't. And then we've, I mean, if you look at it too, there's a lot of rest for both guys this week. Like you said, Vladar's got one day rest, and then there's the Chicago game. So Wolf plays there. Then you got three more days of rest for, let's say, Vladar, and then two more days after that, and then three at home. So there's going to be a lot of time for goalies to rest here. I, I see no reason that goalies shouldn't be at 100%. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, really, until the end of the month, like, you know, even the last road trip, Vegas, and then a day off in Utah, that's not a hard trip either. Like, there should be, you know, yeah, there's going to be some, if you alternate your goalies there, there's no reason they shouldn't be ready to go. Yeah. Well, and realistically, like, after this week, uh, they're basically playing every other day um, heading all the way into November. So, you know, like, that's where, you know, alternating everybody like that basically extends all the way to November 11th, uh, where it's every other day. So, um, more or less it, you know, it's easy to just uh, swap everybody out back and forth and that way nobody gets too rested or rusty either. Well, Matt, next Sunday, I will chat with you again and hopefully we'll be talking about a five and O Calgary flames team. I can't even remember the last time the Flames won three in a row to start the year. I, like it, I, I can't I remember the last time the Flames won three in a row. <laughs> True. <laughs> like, and, and looked good doing it. You know, like there's been a couple times they've snuck one in or something like that or, you know, ground the crap out of their opponent or whatever. Like, when was the last time they handedly won three in a row? I know. It's nice to see, and hopefully... This- I mean... Let's let's be clear here. I'm not saying, you know, let's start planning out a parade route or oh, anything no. like that. It's early in the season. It's nice to see. I think there will be a leveling off period. And even last year, I mean, we saw the Oilers start really poorly and then come on strong later. I think you could see the opposite from the Flames here, but it's it's nice to have some, you know, some fun to start the season with. Yeah. Well, especially with everybody kind of like, oh, <laughs> about the team. Uh, as a whole and like oh we're rebuilding and this is gonna suck and 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 to have exciting fun hockey like even if they lose games it's still fun and exciting and well that's it if they can play this way every or let's say you know for 70 of their 82 games because you're gonna have some bad games everybody does but if they can play this for most of the games even when we lose it's gonna be fun to watch exactly and that's the name of the game like you don't want to be like oh my god what the heck was that for like 70 of the games <laughs> yeah no exactly and okay so let's look at this so the flames are three and three and oh they got two games a season or sorry this week um if they're four and one still very impressed yeah definitely at the end of the week even honestly even if they're three and two i'm still that gonna was be gonna impressed. be my next question yeah because yeah. You know, like, uh, frankly, with expectations of this team, um, not anticipating guys like Huberdo being as good as he has been, um, you know, the, the expectation was kind of to mirror last year's start where it was like 2-7-1, and one, and, you know, like, you're kind of already out of the playoffs before the month is over, and, you know, like, it, you, you always want to be somewhat interested in the season as a whole, and... You know, it, the, it would suck, like, if by, like, the thank, U.S. Thanksgiving that, like, okay, you can pack it in and start reading the scouting reports of the top prospects. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't know what the next week holds. The, the wheels could very easily fall off this thing. Oh, for sure. But, you know, the way they've been playing, I don't get that it's, you know, a fluky couple games. They've been not playing well and coming in and, you know, their opponent's been, you know, outmatching them. Like, I get the sense that if the Flames know what they need to do, and if they can keep doing this, I think that they're they're going to win more than we thought they're going to. Yep, and that's a good thing. And I also think that maybe their opponents so far have maybe mis, misjudged them a little bit, you know, thinking, oh, this is going to be an easy team, an easy game. You know, maybe we don't need to come out as ready. And, again, I think if the Flames get good and teams start to know they're good, and they play them a little bit differently or come out with a different pace, that'll be interesting to see how the Flames adapt as well. Yeah, so especially, you know, like if the Flames start getting a little bit of the taste of their own medicine in terms of the physicality, um, you know, uh, how will they respond to those kinds of things? Exactly. So we'll we'll find all that out. Um, I, f- I feel like the announcer from the 60s Batman, what will happen to the Calgary Flames this week? 
Find out next episode. So we will find out next episode same what bat happens to these Same bat channel. That's right. Same time, same channel next week, and we'll talk to everybody then. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Oh, and the Oilers suck. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.